Hello and welcome to Indie Talks, a monthly news show produced by the Hudson Independent, which is the most trustworthy source of news in the river towns. Uh, my guest today is Michael Bryant, who is a real estate broker and he's also an attorney who often represents clients who are grieving their assessments, which has been, as everyone knows, a pretty big topic around the area for the past three or four years. Uh, since uh, the town of Greenberg did its first reassessment in 60 years, uh, leaving a lot of people with some sticker shock on their tax bills when they saw them the following year. Uh, there are still repercussions from that uh, reassessment, uh, and that's what I wanted to talk to Michael about today, is what is happening in the real estate market, uh, whether people are nervous, whether brokers are nervous about the market which appears to be flattening somewhat, and find out how much of that has to do with taxes and how much of it may be just a natural correction in the market. So, Michael, what is your view right now of the state of the real estate markets? I say that plural because I realize that there are micro markets within any given uh, area. Oh, no doubt about it. You've got um, some varied areas within Greenberg. You've got some affluent areas, you've got some more challenged areas, and, you know, pretty much everything. <coughs> In between, I have to say though, first when you said the first rebound in 60 years, very few things I can say I was not around for. When it happened. <laughs> That's one of them, uh, and so it was. It was needed. There's no doubt it was needed. But now we're we're seeing how the dust is settling and, and what the impact really is. And so if you look at some of the higher end markets, they're seeing uh, a bigger challenge than some of the um, the the areas that are not or have not in the past been so sought after. Right. So that a uh, place like Irvington, where you have a lot of old houses that, have, uh, that are very graceful and well-built houses, uh, but are pretty high-priced or struggling, whereas in some other areas in Greenberg, where houses are five, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000, those are not having problems? Yeah, it's, it's far less impactful on those, uh, in part because they didn't see the, the, the wild vacillations in value. As uh, you remember, 08 things fell apart. Right. Some of the better areas, that were the more affluent areas, the more sought after areas, didn't crash as hard, came back very strong. Um, and some of these other areas just remained much more level. Right. Uh, but I think it's important for, for uh, folks who are either buying or selling to understand the impact of the property taxes and, of course, the new federal limitation on what you can deduct from your property tax. Right. I mean, it's a double whammy. <coughs> 87% of homeowners in Westchester County pay more than $10,000 a year in property taxes. It, it affects virtually everybody. Yeah. Let's go back and review the initial reassessment that was done. Um, some communities, I mentioned Irvington before, I believe had the highest uh, net increase in their, in their assessments and hence their taxes, which was an increase of about 18%. Um, a lot of those people uh, who had big increases grieved uh, you represented some of those people. How did that process go? Do you think it was a fair process? Uh, uh... I think, uh, and you're right, Irvington was ground zero. There's no doubt about it. They had a, uh, a map drawn up after the reval, and it looked like uh, uh, you know, some sort of massacre right there in right. Irvington. It was all red, representing increases of 25% or more. Mm -hmm. Some folks saw their taxes double. Now, it's a little consolation to tell them that you realize that for the last 10 years, you were paying about half what you should have, so you saved about 200 grand. They're not all that happy about that information. All they care about is what's happening going forward. Right. And, and so my job was, uh, in many cases, to, to talk folks off the ledge, you know, say, look, I can't help you. You know, the numbers are the numbers. Your house is worth $900,000. You've been paying as if it were worth 500. Now, I can't help you, because my job is to find evidence to support a reduction. It's not to find evidence to make you feel better <laughs> as a homeowner. If I don't have the evidence to go forward to, to, to represent your case, uh, then I'm going to have to give you the hard news. And a lot of people got that news in the Irvington area especially. Right. Uh, run through what represents legitimate criteria for grieving against a, an increase in your property taxes. And this is important, too, to, to, to evaluate in terms of what happens when I sell my home as opposed to what happens when I live in my home and, and, and try to deal with these taxes. The value of a home is, is a reasonable spectrum of value, right? And this is not like going into Walmart and buying, you know, a widget. <clears throat> no two homes are the same, especially in our area where you might have a colonial next to a Tudor, next to a raised ranch. None of them are the same. Square footage is an issue. 
Uh, condition is an issue, location is an issue, lot size is an issue. All of these variables will give you an ultimate value. But I will hear from folks a lot, hey, well, what if we, if we get my value down to 800 through the grievance process and I want to sell next year, is, isn't that going to hurt me? And the answer is no, because of that spectrum of value. If I'm selling your home, I'm arguing for the higher end of that spectrum. If I'm trying to get your taxes reduced, I'm arguing the lower end of that spectrum. And when somebody comes to look at your home to buy it, they're not going to look at the assessment and say, you know, this thing's listed for 950 the assessment's only eight. What, you know, what's the deal here? You know, somebody's trying to rip me off. Buyers don't do that. They're too savvy. They say, cool, you know, taxes are a little lower than maybe they should be. Going forward, they may increase to at or about what I paid, but right now they're lower and that's a benefit to me. So as a homeowner, not only do you benefit while you're in the home because the taxes are lower, but you benefit when you're going to sell because they are lower at least initially when the, when the buyer takes the, the, the sale. <coughs> After the fact of the reassessment, uh, the town of Greenberg came up with a partial solution which was to create a kind of step up, a three year step up in the increase of people whose houses were uh, uh, assessed at 25% or more of what they had been in the past. Um, was that a successful step uh, or is it, in my view, maybe it was something that should have been done before they even did the assessment to prepare for it. But I think it, it was, work. I think it helped. It certainly helped. And I think the pain on those who didn't qualify for it, and that's critical to, to realize, if you had a 24% increase, you didn't qualify for the phase in. You, you ate it all in that first year. Uh, so by phasing in those only above the 25% level, it did minimize the pain. Everybody else had to pick up the slack. Mm -hmm. So if you weren't getting the phase in, you were paying for the other guy that did. So that was a little bit of a tough, uh, tough swallow for a lot of folks. Right. But I think it was a reasonable way to do it. It was, um, it was not as hard to do, apparently, through the uh, assessor's office. They weren't happy about it. But it, it meant more paperwork, right. obviously. And now the real question is, and it's over now. It's everybody's now up to full, full speed. Um, what is the ultimate impact going to be? The theory being, if now everybody's paying their fair share, then the overall rate should drop. And the overall impact on your taxes, whether you have the phase in or not, mm -hmm. should be uh, leveled out. Right. It's too soon to tell. That will be the next cycle. We'll right. see whether that really worked or not. You mentioned earlier the change in the federal tax law, the not the elimination of, but a cap on $10,000 of the state and local tax, or SALT, as the acronym goes. Um, how much has that played? That's a, that's a new thing. It's something that Governor Cuomo has challenged first trying to uh, treat local taxes as a charitable deduction, and now he's suing the federal government. How much of a role is that salt thing playing? You know, uh, we don't know yet. We don't know for sure. I think it's, it's making people a little hesitant. I think we're seeing more buyers sit on the sidelines, just kind of waiting to see what happens. Remember, those new rules kick in when you do your taxes in April right. 2019. That'll be the first point at which you or your CPA crunch the numbers with the new deductions, with the alternative minimum tax issues. All of these things will finally be kind of uh, resolved all at once, and we'll see what the bottom line is. My gut is it ain't going to be good. You know, it's not going to be a tax savings. But how big an impact it's going to be, we just don't know yet. Yeah. Some people push back on the impact of that salt cap uh, on the grounds you mentioned the alternative minimum tax, that people who own houses that are one, and a half, one, one and a half million dollars or more are almost surely going to be in income brackets that make them qualify for the um, alternative minimum tax. So how much of, does that mitigate this problem, or who does it leave in the dust? Yeah, that's what we're going to find out, because there are folks, if you just barely qualify for that, you're probably not going to benefit as much. And I'm not a CPA. I don't play one on TV at all. I, I, I just know enough to be dangerous. And in this case, if you are well into the AMT, the alternative minimum tax, I think you're going to benefit more. If you barely crawl your way into it, probably not much. Uh, some of the people who suffered aren't necessarily people who just lived in old houses and you know, were lucky enough not to be uh, reassessed over that period of time, but people who live in some of the houses close to the village uh, that originally were working class neighborhoods, but some of those houses kept growing in evaluation and some of them were being bought up by families coming up from the city, uh, kind of gentrifying these areas. Um, what I heard a lot about is families who weren't making a lot of money who suddenly found their assessments at a point where they could not afford to stay in their houses. Did you run into that in the course of your... Oh yeah, and a lot of it's fixed income scenarios, you know, mm -hmm. folks who've retired have been in that little home there, you know, on Main Street for 30, 40 years, 
Yeah, and they had they had no choice. But there's really no proper uh, remedy for them. What what are you going to do? Uh, they've already got star probably, and maybe even enhanced star if they qualify. There's only so much you can do to bring it down without effectively giving them free a free ride, yeah. and that just wasn't going to happen. Right, right. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the possible solutions to this problem. Uh, but before I get into that, I've got ahead of myself a little bit. Um, the uh, the market as it is today, how do you see it? Uh, I hear people complaining, some of the brokers, that the market is slowing down. Houses are staying on the market longer than they have been. Do you have some statistics or any sense of waiting? We get spoiled, that? too. That's part of the problem. Okay. I mean, we get spoiled the last three or four years. You know, as a broker, you'd have an open house with a new listing on a Sunday, and then Monday it's just ferreting through, hey, which one, uh, which one is my guy going to take? Yeah. And then it's off the market. Um, now, that happens, it still happens, but the house has to be perfect. I mean, it really does. Most of our buyers are coming up from the city. You aren't seeing people that live in New Rochelle buying in Irvington or vice versa. You know, mm -hmm. most of the folks are coming north uh, when they get, that, they get to the level where their kids need a school, whatever it may be. Those folks come up here and they're, they're lazy. You know, they, they want a house that's done, done. So if your house is done, done, you're going to still have some very serious interest in it if it's priced right, if it's perceived as a value. So we still see that. But we used to see it with everything, even if the house needed a ton of work, even if the house, uh, you know, you needed a super uh, vision, an imagination to figure out what it could be. We still saw, you know, a battle for it. Right. Not anymore. And again, I think it's because buyers are taking a step back to see how all of these tax issues shake down, you know. Um, when they're looking at a million dollar house in most of these areas at 30 plus thousand in taxes per year, um, and then not being able to write off two-thirds of that, right. they're just not sure what the bottom line is going to be. And so that is definitely cooling the market. I'm not ready to say that it's a buyer's market, um, but it is flatter than we've seen, and because we were so spoiled, this re new reality makes it feel worse than it is. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the kind of prototypical family you hear about coming up from Brooklyn, uh, Almost always Brooklyn. I don't Seems know. like it. I don't know how anybody's <laughs> left in Brooklyn. They've all, they've all come up. Here. Exactly. Uh, but they're coming up and they're looking at those big tax bills and they're kind of waving it off because, in their view, what they're leaving behind is a prospect where they're going to probably have to send their kids to private schools. Um, and in those cases, you're talking about tuitions that are 40, 50. Oh, yeah. We're, we're a bargain up here because if you have, I mean, it's simple crunching of the numbers. If you have two kids, you're going to put them in some level of private school in the city. Now you're looking at 70, 80 grand a year. I can come up to uh, to uh, Dobbs Ferry, spend thirty four thousand, all in, mm -hmm. not just for school, but all property taxes. That's a bargain, you yeah. know. So let's have more kids and let's bring you know bring them to the north, and, and it ends up being a, a super deal for them. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no doubt about it. You mentioned you know the impact in terms of uh, uh, um, homes on the market. How many are there? How many? Well, if you look at some of the statistics, they're really skewed. We've talked about Irvington. Let's talk about that specifically again. That municipality, village, in the first six months of this year versus the first six months of last year went from an absorption rate, meaning here's how many homes we, we have on the market and here's how long it'll take to sell them, right. from five months to 11 months. Wow. Yeah, that's the extreme. There are many others. Uh, I think Dobbs Ferry is, is probably uh, eight months now. Varying areas, no, nobody went down. Let's put it that way. Right. No inventory absorption rate went down. Everything's gone up year to year based on the first six months of this year. Right. Who did the best out of all? That? Oh, who did the best? I think, uh, and, and again, sometimes sample size is critical, but Bedford did very well. I think they were relatively flat, in fact, which is good. If you were five months before and you're five months now, that's under the circumstances, that's pretty good. Right, yeah. Uh, again, getting back to possible solutions. Um, what do you see as the prospects? You're, a, you're an attorney, so you look at Andrew Cuomo's attempt, uh, along with some other Democratic governments, to sue the federal government, saying that it is unconstitutional and uh, 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 discrimination against New York State and other high tax yeah. states. Nobody's going to be boo-hooing, though. You know, it's, right. it's, it's so hard to feel sympathy for folks who make as much money as the folks who deal with that tax issue here. Right. Uh, and the fact is, when, when the law was enacted, the impact was to Southern California, our area, Northern California, and there's some some argument that uh, that uh, Arizona had some impact as well, but nothing like ours. So we're talking about pretty large areas, but in the big scheme of things, dots on the map of home ownership, and that's why 
it, it was not a big deal for, for, right. for it to pass and get thrown through. So the question is, how, how do you fix it? I don't think you can challenge it in the courts successfully. I don't. I think it keeps it maybe top of the uh, newspaper, mm -hmm. above the fold, but I don't think that it's going to be successful ultimately. Keep the topic up front, keep people talking about it, maybe some legislation can be enacted that will truly fix the problem. I don't see it happening anytime soon. Mm -hmm. How about the idea of making taxes a charitable deduction? I think it's clever, novel. Um, I try to do that every year myself. <laughs> but that just put in, it's a, just a different line on the form. What's a big deal? Um, you know, I, I think it's, um, it's it would be challenged ultimately. Yeah. But I personally am very aggressive with the IRS. You know, and um, I I like to see what they what they think about my various deductions. <laughs> Come on, bring it on. Let's see what let's see what we think. Well, you're a risk taker. I'm not so. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's the worst that could happen? As Al Capone said. <laughs> uh, okay, so going through another uh, issue that people bring up is the discrepancy in the taxation of condominiums and co-ops as opposed to residential yeah, units. Yeah, that's a hot topic. My understanding is that co-ops and condominiums aren't taxed by the value of the property, but rather by what the potential rent is uh, for the unit. It's a wacky rent. structure. It's a fiction that was that was developed many, many years ago. The idea was, how do we get people from renting to ownership right. without you know, suffering the burden of ownership, which involves abatements and taxes? They created this fiction called uh, the rent value taxation. Ad valorem, meaning value, is how most properties right. are taxed. For condominiums, it is based on the value of the rent of that unit. So that generally works out to about 55, 60% of the actual market value. The idea being, get some folks from renting to home ownership, we'll give them a break on their taxes to make it more doable. Mm -hmm. And then when they grow up and be big boys and girls, they'll get a real house, and then they'll pay the full load. Well, the fact is, it doesn't mean anything anymore. People downsize to condos, people live in condos till they die. It, it's no longer necessary to give them that incentive or that tax break. But it ain't going anywhere. It's you know, if you live in that scenario and and uh, you get used to that level of taxation, mm -hmm. there's going to be a huge pushback for right. anybody that's trying to change that. Well, the state has allowed individual communities to vote themselves as to whether or not they want to get rid of that uh, distinction between residential housing and co-ops, mm -hmm. and some, especially upstate New York, have done that. Some big cities uh, here in Greenberg. Um, uh, that effort was brought up, but uh, the town council voted it down some time back, refusing to go that way. When I asked Paul Feiner, the, uh, the town supervisor, why, he said, the problem is not so much the discrepancy between the condos and co-ops on the one hand and residential houses, it's that the business taxes, commercial taxes, have to go into that same mix. And therefore, uh, what you do is you level the playing field to the great detriment of the commercial taxation, and that you drive a lot of businesses out of town, especially along Central Avenue, which is uh, already showing some signs of weakness. Is that a good argument? Or? I don't think it's it's an argument. I don't think it's a great argument because I think if you crunch all the numbers, and I don't have them handy, but I think just in general concept, um, and it wouldn't just be the commercial businesses that would help carry the load. Everybody. All tax <coughs> entities, public, private, commercial, they're all going to help shoulder that burden. I don't think we are so overrun with condos and co-ops that it would uh, seriously affect anybody. It would be pretty well spread out. Painful for everybody. Mm -hmm. But I don't see a, a, a valid, legitimate business going out of business just because of that. They've got other issues. And that tips them over. I can see that. But just uh, in and of itself, no. There's some housing communities that I don't understand why they are necessarily residential or why they are a condominium set up. Uh, you have a lot of attached housing units that are taxed as if they were separate single family homes, and then you have some that are taxed as condos. Uh, there's a case in Dobbs Ferry, the landing, which is a 103 unit uh, attached housing thing, very upscale, um, that has basically declared itself to be a condominium. Um, my understanding is the town of Greenberg has said, mm -hmm, we're not accepting that. Uh, the landing is challenging that uh, through a grievance, I guess, is the way they do it. Do they have a case? I, I, again, I doubt it for the same reasons. You know, these things are determined at the time of development. And um, you could drive through the landing, or you can drive through another little development there in Irvington called Harriman's Keep. You could dr drive through uh, uh, in Scarsdale, uh, Chelsea Place, I think it is. 
Um, you can't tell one from another. Is this taxed as a single family home? Is this taxed as a, a condo? You can't tell the difference. And, and there really is no difference except in the legal designation, which was done when the, when the project was developed. So it would be so nice if you could go in, let's say you have an accessory apartment in your house. Okay? So you have your home, and you have an accessory apartment. I, I got a condo. This is, this is just a two-unit condo. So you go in and immediately your taxes are cut in half. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the same idea they're trying to do there on a much larger scale. I don't think it's going to be successful. Mm -hmm. They'll be disappointed to hear that. Yeah. Well, obviously, I'm not the end-all decider, right. so... <laughs> exactly. Uh, again, back to the solutions. Uh, on a village I, level, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I never did answer your question. Yeah. I went over here and there, and then I came back. <laughs> I think consolidation is probably the simplest way to do it, and simple in the, in the context that uh, everything else is more difficult. Consolidation is not really simple. You know, combining school districts, combining uh, police forces, combining any public service that you can. And those ideas have been shot down every time they've been brought up. The big ones. The big ones. I mean, we have, what happens is you have people who love their little communities, their village, their town, whatever it may be, and they may complain about the cost of those villages, but you try and take away their identity, their, their singular uh, police department with their four detectives, I don't know what they're detecting, um, and they don't like that. So the bottom line is, if you want those things, if you want that uniqueness, you're going to pay. You're going to pay for it. But consolidation is really the way to, to minimize the budget expenses. Right. Uh, George Latimer, the new county executive, has got this shared services program that he's promoting. It wasn't his program, it was actually developed by the state. Uh, with an incentive that they would match dollar for dollar whatever savings you uh, could uh, could document, um, but that has its limits. I mean, has, there have been some successes. I gather the village of Mount Kisco is now has county police doing their policing for them and saving two and a half million dollars a year. Yeah, no, that's significant. Yeah. That's good. I've heard other examples in Ardsley. Uh, I think they closed the justice court there uh, and threw it onto Greenberg and saved like twenty five thousand. Right. So. You know, that's a little more so form you could do over that. substance. You could get rid of all the village judges and have it all. Yeah, and maybe you'd them. save based on that because they're part-time judges. You know, they're not full-time jobs. So maybe you're going to save 100 grand or so, mm -hmm. 200. I mean, in the big scheme of things, it's nothing. I mean, don't get me started on where the money's going because that we can't fix that. <laughs> that's pensions, yeah. and retirement plans, and medical for teachers, cops, whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's it's it is almost half of most budgets in, in yeah. these communities. Unfunded pension uh, apparently makes up a, is a big problem that a lot of people haven't addressed. But that's kind of outside the scale of what your average homeowner is. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> but, you know, if they start digging in to see, well, where's my tax dollar going? Yeah. You know, that, that's what they're going to find out. If you look at most school budgets, roughly 24% of the budget goes to pensions and other things that uh, right. are no longer helping directly the residents. Well, I guess I wonder is whether or not this new attention to taxes and uh, their level isn't going to make people think a little bit more about those consolidations that you talked about, uh, and maybe even get to the point where they would entertain uh, merging the Irvington and Ardsley and Dobbs Ferry School Districts and giving up the Bulldogs and the Eagles and whatever other <laughs> mascots. But might there be something in between, for example, administrative sharing, uh, get rid of all those you know, three different uh, deputy superintendents for curriculum yep. uh, that exist in the school systems now. Yeah, I, I think that's that's an easy call. Uh, we have a superintendent for each of these villages with their own district. Uh, I mean, that's it's two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollar a year job. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that's that's a lot of money. I like uh, <laughs> Dr. Chris Harrison, but come on, dude, you know that's that's a lot of money. Chris Harrison being the superintendent of the Irvington yes, School District. Yes, he is. Uh, and his counterparts in each of the villages are earning a fair, fair amount of money themselves. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. uh, here's another thought. We have in Westchester and New York State four different levels of government. We have a village government, we have a town government, we have a county government, and we have a state government. Am I missing something? Maybe. That's, that's about it. So, yeah. so do we need all those levels of government? New England states uh, don't have counties, they have just towns. Uh, Paul Feiner thinks that's a great idea. Uh, other people think that maybe the town of Greenberg is superfluous and that we ought to just go from the villages to the county. Uh, you have any thoughts on which of those 
My general thought is that I've never seen adding a layer of government save you money, <laughs> ever. And now you, you talk about Edgemont, who wants to become a village. Right. Uh, I don't know if they have any clue what they'd be getting into, yeah. because they get all their services right now from the town. They would then end up contracting with the town for the same services they're now getting, just to get a certain amount of autonomy, which I think right. is what they're looking for. At what cost? Not, it's not going to be cheap. So is the Edgebot case a case of be careful what you wish for? Yeah, I think uh, you know the, the folks who want it are very vocal. I think there's a very quiet and possibly majority of the folks there that either don't care or don't want it, right. but they're just not as loud. Uh -huh. <laughs> that does carry a lot of weight, doesn't yeah. it? Uh, go back to the housing market again. I, I was fascinated to see some interesting anomalies in there. Big old houses, Villa Luaro, which is the home of Madame C.J. Walker in Irvington, as you know, it's a beautiful big estate. Villa Nui, which was John Jacob Astor's house, which is down in Ardsley Park. These are multi-million dollar houses that are that can't can't be sold. Oh, yeah. uh, on the other hand, you have um, Andy Todd, who's a developer building Greystone on Hudson, uh, and 100 acres opposite the Lyndhurst Estate. These are houses that he's on the market has in the market for between five and thirteen million dollars, and he's selling some of them. Not a lot, but he's selling some. Do you have any thoughts on what explains the difference? Boy, well, it gets back to one of my original comments about those folks with that kind of money, finance mm -hmm. people generally. They want new, 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 right. and those are new, new, new. They're nice. I've seen them. They're beautiful. Uh, I think you can probably get a deal on one now. Uh, <laughs> if you want to wander over there, probably get one for eight. You know. Hey. Uh, so uh, I think that's what it is. I represented a home on, in Matheson Park who was taxed at 12.5 million. When I got done, it was taxed at 8.5 million. It is still on the market now for 5.9. Right. So what are the real estate taxes on a property that's valued at 8.5 million? Let's see. That would be roughly quarter of a million dollars, maybe a little more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It makes you wonder. Should when you try to assign the relationship between a quarter of a million dollars in property taxes and what portion of government services that's paying for, shouldn't there be a cap yeah. maybe on, on uh, the amount of taxes? That, I mean, you could build a hundred million dollar house and get a lot of money, but for what? Yeah, no, that's a good point. It, it, it becomes a, almost a commercial property at that mm -hmm. point, and yet it's not generating any sort of revenue like a commercial property would for the owner. Right. Uh, yeah, it's never been talked about, and I think we end up with, you know, that's the top of the, uh, of the pyramid. People don't care that much about right. that. <laughs> Boo-hoo, you have a $12 million house. Uh, I just think that's, that's the mindset. Yeah, right. It's, uh, right. Schadenfreude, I think, is the term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're just not going to get a lot of, drum up a lot of support. Let's go help those folks right. with the $12 million yeah. houses. Right. Well, very good. This has been a fascinating conversation. Pleasure to meet you. You know, everybody should know you're, you're a big deal. This guy, this Time Magazine. Uh, you know, <laughs> this guy doesn't just sit here on the chair. Uh, you know, it's a pleasure to finally meet you because we've talked on the phone many we times. We have, and uh, you've been a great resource, and I hope you continue to be in the future. Uh, pleasure. Yes. Great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, sir.